Welcome to Divine Love Talk with Dr. Parthenia Grant, where we talk about health, well-being, and the love of the divine that exists in all of us. Now, here's your host, Dr. Parthenia Grant. All right. I'm so excited to um, bring an amazing filmmaker um, to the show today, Adam Schell, Sorry, directed uh, a critically acclaimed film called Pursuing Happiness. Um, I, I'm going to start out by saying that we live our emotional state according to conditional things that are continually playing around in our mind. But today we're going to look at unconditional ways to sustain the level of happiness in your life by ex examining or just taking a quick look at the effect of money, fame, education, power, doing good deeds, self-sufficiency, health, and freedom on our levels of happiness. We'll also look at the delicate balance between profound levels of happiness and mournful sorrow. Now, that's an interesting dichotomy. But by the end of the show, we will offer you some of the priceless tidbits that director Adam Shell learned from his pursuit of happiness in a film that took him around the world in his pursuit of happiness. Welcome, Adam Shell. Hi, how are you? Oh, I'm so excited that you did the film. Um, I, I have to tell you, it's it's a topic that's very, very close to my heart because I have traveled all over the world <clears throat> in pursuit of happiness. And um, as a college professor, I actually incorporated the book, The Geography of Bliss, in my curriculum. It was a, a book about a grumpy journalist who decided that he was just going to go to do the research on the countries and the world that, that, had, that he thought might have the highest highest levels of happiness and um, the, the book was really amazing what he found out and of course America did not rank very high uh, on, the, of course, right? <laughs> on the happiness quotient <laughs> well, which is part in part why I made the film you know because I saw that same trend of just you know and, and you know not for nothing you know obviously 2008 and the, the big economy crash was a, a really big source of unhappiness for a lot of people but you know even before that i saw this yeah. growing trend of just people not being happy and not being able to find happiness and you know and then uh you know even after we started to get out of the uh you know economic downturn and things started to come back around you still saw very uh, a great deal of unhappiness and you know in 2012 the u.n did a, oh yeah uh, a world <laughs> happiness report that now they release every year uh-huh and we're and we're like 23rd on that list. Wow, that's pretty sad. I mean, and, and then when you consider we're way lower that lower than that in terms of uh, our educa <laughs> our educational levels, you know, with our children. So there yeah. may, there may be some <laughs> correlation there. <laughs> Maybe yes. <laughs> Maybe. But, you know, Adam, what I also noticed was, um, because you mentioned 2012, was sort of this low-level anxiety um, that is kind of pervasive in American society that I have personally, in my research and, of course, um, you know, teaching thousands of young college students um, and surveying them, a, a lot of it has to do with them not finding very much meaning meaning in life or um, not feeling as if they have a purpose in life. And then when you add on top of that, um, young college students learning critical thinking in my classes, which is what I was teaching, um, right. them examining the corruption um, in from every level of government around the world and, yeah. and, and their concerns about the earth and the pollution and their future. And so the reason I incorporated the book, um, The Pursuit of Bliss, was because of the high levels of stress and anxiety and panic attacks and um, literal suicide attempts by um, students and the high level of suicide rates around the world with young yeah. people. So that's why I thought that your film is very, very important being produced by an American. And I thought that you um, came up with some amazing stuff. So can I just share with you the, the four people that I thought, you know, impressed me the most in your film? Absolutely. Okay. Well, of course, Gloria. 
You know, we yeah. we, we yeah. have to start with Gloria. And I have to ask you, um, are, didn't you at least feel this profound sense of um, sort of um, gratitude that you opened up the film with her and that you got to capture so many amazing moments with her? Uh, yeah, I mean, that was that was one of the things that we just really lucked out on. I right? mean, it's, it's funny because when, when we first started the film, you know, this was a project that I've been, you know, working on and just not working on, you know, daily, but, you know, putting together and had it in the back of my head and mm-hmm. doing some research and stuff. And when I finally decided, okay, I'm ready, I'm going to start shooting, um, I, I was searching and searching and searching for a producer. And I yeah. didn't have anybody, and I went through several different people. And, you know, this project very much required the right oh, absolutely. person to work with me. Because yeah, it, totally. You know, it was so outlandish. Mm-hmm. I needed somebody crazy enough to be like, sure, I'll go on this ride with you. <laughs> I mean, I was just out there, I'm like, I'm going to find the happiest people in America. <laughs> Everybody's well, look, like, that in in and of itself was uh, <laughs> crazy, <laughs> right? Exactly. And so th- that that first day that we spent with Gloria was was a major turning point in the project. It right. Was very early on. Well, I, Adam, I don't think it was an accident. I, I don't believe in accidents right? or, or coincidences. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm right there with you. I, Sometimes it takes a little while to realize <laughs> the the good in some of these accidents. But, oh yeah, yeah. You it, know, but they're definitely it's there. And you know, so I had my Nicholas, who ended up producing the film with me, mm-hmm. uh, was just working for my production company as an intern. Oh wow! He had, he had graduated college and he came back uh, to LA, and he was only going to be here for the summer. So uh-huh. he came, and, and I was just like dragging him around with me. I'm like, here, hold the camera. Here, you know, do that. Here, do that. <laughs> And, Make yourself uh, useful. <laughs> right, exactly. And that day we went and saw Gloria, and, and he got the project at first, and he had done a lot of research for me, and so he understood it on an intellectual level. Mm-hmm. And when we went to see Gloria that very first day, and the very first day, to just mind you, to place you is that interview where we're sitting in her house, mm-hmm. you know, at the, at the very beginning of the film. That was that day. And she's so happy about the dirt. Now, you know, I can right? relate to that. <laughs> I, I can see you were challenged. <laughs> I, was, I was definitely challenged. I have a newfound love, respect, and admiration for the dirt. Okay. I will, I will tell you that. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if I've taken it as far as Gloria quite yet, but, you know, maybe one day I'll get there. But look, uh, everybody knows me. I, I'm in a condo, and I have a little corner unit, but it wraps around, and I have the most amazing patio garden um, uh, that the Homeowners Association allowed me to just plant grapevines and trees and oh, nice. uh, all edibles. and. I'm so happy, like the neighbors, you know, they're now starting to imitate me. And uh, I'm not, ha- I'm, nothing makes me happier than climbing up on these big, you know, planters that they made a part of the landscaping and getting my feet in the dirt and my hands in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> right? There is, there is a, a lot of pleasure there. I mean, it's really, it's about connecting with the earth and, you know, really just knowing, putting yourself in perspective, I think, was glorious you know, uh, part of her thing. But, you know, back to that first day, you know, when we walked out of there after spending that time with her, Nicholas, I, I know, granted, for me, it wasn't anything unusual because I'd known Gloria. Oh, She'd been somebody okay. that was a really good friend of my wife for many years. Okay. And so I knew her. So going over and spending an afternoon with her was just, you know. Like, regular. It, it was regular. It was regular. <laughs> exactly. It was something too. It's like, oh, hey, Gloria, what's up, you know. But Nicholas had never met her before, and I told him very little before we got there. Uh-huh. And he was, well, he was like, okay, I'm, I'm in. I, I want to do this. <laughs> I get it now. Well, you know, like, honestly, I have to say to you, until I, you know, when, when the producer originally sent me a little bit of information about your film, I was thinking, you know, this was before I saw it and before I actually read, you know, the, the whole uh, write-up on it. I was thinking, yeah, this is going to be another one of those new age, you know, it's all good and there's right. nothing bad in the world, you know, except you're making it and that kind of thing. And, and this right. whole denial, you know, that, you know, pain and suffering and misery and sorrow exist on this planet. It's like sometimes 
times I want to go, what planet do you live on? I, I would like to know um, that you think that there is, it's all good. Um, so when I realized that, oh, he's, he's doing it from a complete perspective of trying to find the balance between the good and the bad, then I was in it, you know, and I was like, okay, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about watching the film. So I salute That's you great. for, for, for taking that holistic approach and, and allowing the journey to unfold. Yeah, they, you know, it's interesting you say that because when I set out to make the project, you know, part of my motivation was I want to highlight happiness. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do something that I didn't see enough of in our society, sure. you know. We highlight a lot of tragedy, yep. and, you know, we know a lot about that stuff, mm -hmm. but we don't highlight the happiness. And so that was what I was out to do. Yeah. Um, and at first, I just wanted to make that happy film. I was like, I'm going to make a film that it's going to be all happiness and bliss. And, <laughs> yeah, and right. Like you said, show all this, you know, everything's perfect and mm -hmm. you can have it too kind of attitude. Yeah. And people were asking me, you know, oh, don't you want to kind of, you know, go with people and see their journey and how they discovered happiness? And I was like, no, 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 no. I don't care. I don't want to go to, I don't want to go to sadness. I only want to go to happiness. Yeah. No, no, we're, 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 in a, uh, we're on a planet that has duality, darkness and light. You can't have one right? without the other. So it's like it's not you complete. You know? Right, exactly. And that's what I discovered, you know, in just the making of the film. I was like, it's not complete. And the happiest people I found, all of them had these amazing, intricate stories of life and living and going through some of the most horrific things you can imagine. Yes, yeah, struggle. Yeah. Struggle. And, and then finding their way back to happiness. And that's, that's why that third act of the film is titled, How Do We Find Happiness in Tragedy? Exactly. Now let's move on to my next favorite character, which is Randy from Randy Land. Yes, Randy. <laughs> now, you, now we're going backwards to the all happiness. <laughs> well, but, but no, but Randy, um, his happiness grew out of a very tragic um, childhood where, you know, he became... Uh, th this person um, who is absolutely amazing because he was in this big family and they were so poor they didn't they couldn't have anything for Christmas and he's in third grade and he decides he's going to go out and find things that people throw away and fix them up and then he gave all of, I think it was like nine kids in his family all of them amazing gifts that he had found and refurbished for Christmas, and when he saw how much happiness that brought his siblings and his family, that profoundly changed his life, and that created Randy Land. Now, that was my take on it. What What about you? Yeah, you, you know, you're 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 exactly right. I mean, I think at a very young age, he discovered that the key to happiness was making other people happy. Mm -hmm. You know, and <clears throat> in that experience, when he, you know, and he. He was finding things in the garbage. Yes, you know, he'd walk exactly. around his neighborhood and be like, "Oh, there's a bike, a rusty mm -hmm. old bike that somebody's throwing away." And he'd take it, and he'd sand out the rust, and yeah. he'd put some paint on it or whatever, you know. Amazing what and, paint can do, right? Because that exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and his his house is a testament to that, I right? You, right? And all of these bright, happy colors and, and you know, yeah. him transforming abandoned buildings, you know, into magical kingdoms and these abandoned lots into gardens. Um, Isn't he's, that amazing? Oh, my God. How can they uh, get your film? You can go onto our website, pursuinghappiness.com. We are continuing our episode on pursuing happiness with my co-host, Kim Michaels, and his weekly message from the Ascended Masters. I am the Ascended Master Mother Mary and I am happy to talk about the topic of happiness. I do understand my beloved the human condition having been embodiment in embodiment myself on planet Earth. I do understand that for many people happiness is a difficult topic. It seems like the goal is always just a little too far away and you can never quite reach it. I understand also that for many people happiness is seen as basically freedom from something unpleasant, freedom from suffering. Many people think that if only they can get away from the conditions that make them suffer, then they will automatically be happy. This is one of the main problems 
that prevents many people from truly experiencing happiness. When you understand what we have talked about now for many years, the duality consciousness, where there is always two opposite polarities, you see that seeking happiness by getting away from something unpleasant simply cannot work. The more you push towards one dualistic extreme, the more you will also attract the opposite dualistic extreme, and the reason for this is simple. You are subconsciously saying to the universe that you want to experience drama, you want to experience the contrast between the highs and the lows, between happiness and unhappiness. If your view of happiness is that it is the opposite polarity to unhappiness, then how can you ever get away from suffering? Because the kind of happiness that is the opposite of suffering cannot exist alone. It can only exist in a polarity with suffering and if you never experience suffering, you could never experience that kind of happiness. That is why we encourage the more spiritual people to realize that it is necessary to step up and question the dualistic view of happiness and more approach something that has by many traditions been called bliss, that has no contrast, that has no ups and downs, highs and lows and opposite polarities. This, however, will require you to make some major adjustments in the way you look at happiness, because you need to realize that when you seek bliss, you will not have the ups and the downs, you will not have the contrast, and therefore there will be people who will say, well, that sounds boring. And that, my beloved, is one of the reasons why this entire planet, many, many millions of years ago, started a downward spiral that has led to the current condition where most people think that suffering is normal and unavoidable. But it is not normal. It is normal in the sense that it is common, but it is not normal in the sense that it is natural, for it is not natural to suffer. The Elohim, the spiritual beings who created planet Earth, created this planet in its original form so that it could provide everything that you need without you having to struggle for it. And therefore, there is no need for suffering when the Earth is in its natural state. The Earth is not in its natural state right now, but you can still, as a spiritual person, rise above the duality consciousness and achieve the kind of happiness that has no opposite, that has no contrast. But you need to recognize that it also requires you to let go of the sense of drama, what we have called the epic mindset, where there always has to be some opponent that you are fighting, that you are in a competition with. You cannot see yourself as being an opponent to anybody or any force if you are to attain true bliss that has no contrast. And that is, of course, a step that many people are not ready to take. I fully understand this. But some will understand because some are ready to go beyond the dualistic form of happiness and unhappiness and experience true bliss. Wow, that was amazing. Uh, Adam, we will be back after commercial break. I took a few notes on that because it actually dovetails with your research in pursuing happiness. Adam, um, what did you think about that um, dictation from Mother Mary? Yeah, you know, I thought it was great. I mean, it was definitely very much in line with what we discovered. And, you know, that's what I was, like I was talking about before, and the thing that stuck with me the most is that you have to have this duality. You mm -hmm. have to experience life, you, you know, and, and if, you don't, if you're not experiencing one side of the emotion, how can you experience the other? And that's, you know, to me, that's what life is all about, is experiencing the highs and experiencing the lows. And the highs only get better when you can sit there and you say, you know what, I'm, I'm super happy, I'm feeling great, things are going well. 
Remember that time when they weren't? Oh, man, uh -huh. that was crazy, right? Yeah, it's the, the, the contrast. But you know what? Um, remember I told you I was using the book um, Geography of Bliss, and I, yeah. I found that really interesting that Mother Mary said that the way – to move beyond um, the contrast and the duality of suffering mm -hmm. is to seek bliss where there is no contrast. And, and the other point about um, suffering uh, not being normal, natural, or unavoidable, when you go back to Gloria, um, yeah. Anyone in her circumstances would have been absolutely morose, um, feeling like a victim and feeling sorry for themselves, and definitely suffering. And, and she was beyond a shadow of a doubt the happiest, just like seeing her on camera just made me happy. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, like for any of us, like in her situation at 28 years old, when you're diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer... I mean, every single one of us thinks of that as, you know, oh, my God, my life is over. Yes. You know, everything Done. from here on out is horrible. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be dealing with this disease. It's get my affairs in order, say goodbye, and it's horrible. And she somehow, somehow had this innate ability to turn that whole situation into the best thing that's ever happened to her. Well, and... Well, Adam, I want, I want to just say, I think because you captured her on that film, what hit me is that that was a part of her destiny in life was to leave that message for, you know, and make it immortal. You know, when you put something on film, it becomes yeah. immortalized. And so yeah. her uh, philosophy about, you know, a disease does not have to define you. Um, right. and does not have to determine whether you can live life to the fullest every moment of every day, that's a powerful message. And you immortalize that for her on that film. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, what she, what she says in the, in the end of the film when she says, you know, we all go through life thinking we're all guaranteed 80 years. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and somehow she says, you know, I hate it when people say their life was cut short. Mm-hmm. And, and the philosophy, her philosophy behind that is, it's not cut short if you live every day to the fullest. If you experience life, yes, some lives are longer, some mm -hmm. lives are shorter, and yeah. we just, we have no idea when our last day is going to be. Mm -hmm. And the point is that if you live your life thinking, oh, there's plenty of time to do that mm -hmm. stuff, I'll be happy when, right? then you're you're never going to get there because you're constantly, it's all conditional, like you said in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. It's conditional yeah. of all these other things. And what Gloria exemplified so beautifully is that happiness is not conditional. Yeah. In fact, the conditions can be exactly opposite, mm -hmm. and you can still be extremely happy. And she just recognized that, and she figured out the things that made her happy, and that's where she spent her time, and that's where she spent her energy and that's where she kept her head focused. And, and everyone, and she made everyone around her happy. Um, yes. So, you know, you made a very cogent, I mean, you brought up a very cogent point that she made about it, it, it has nothing to do with the number of years that you think you are, you know, given um, to be on this earth. Because, you know, quite frankly, I know some people <laughs> in their 70s and 80s and who have money. You know, and time and leisure to be doing, you know, amazing things, you know, on the planet and are some of the most miserable people I've ever met. And they're doing absolutely nothing, you know, worthwhile with their lives. And so I'm looking at them and going, what is your point? OK, right. <laughs> what are you whining right. about? <laughs> right. Exactly. And you know what? You, you never met somebody on their deathbed who said, hey, I, I wish I complained more. I wish. <laughs> I wish I had some more time to make people miserable and complain. Right? They, they they usually end up there full of regrets, going, you know, oh, I wish I would have, you know, been nicer to my kids. I right? wish I would have, you know, made better contribution to society. And, and you know, listen, I, you know, none of these things are easy. It's not like we just say, oh, go do it, go decide to be happy, and then all of a sudden you're happy. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the thing that you know Gary um, Van Warmdam spells out so beautifully at the beginning of Act 3 there when, you know, we're walking on the beach and, you know, he says, you know, the goal is to get yourself to a, a point of strength and endurance that you can turn something in, that you can turn on a dime. And the example he gives, he says, so say, 
you know, my loved one, you know, my girlfriend or wife says, you know, hey, I'm leaving you. I want to go be with somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, he says, your expression is your experience of life. So Mm -hmm. if you say there in that moment, oh, my God, I hate you, Mm -hmm. what you're putting out into the world is hate and and misery. And so you're experiencing that hate and misery right there in that moment as you put it out. You don't have to wait for karma, per se, (laughs) to bring it back around. Exactly. You've already experienced it. But Uh in that situation, if you can put love out, say, you know what, I love you and I want you to be happy. And if you're not happy with me, well then I hope you can go find your happiness wherever it is, and I wish you the best. And all I'm going to do is, is express love. Then you experience that love. And I yes. think, I was like, oh, yeah, but that's like, that's hard. That's impossible. Well, you know, because- but listen, Adam, I, I tell that to my students all the time. It's just like, why would you want to be with someone who doesn't want to be with you anymore? And if you say you love that person and they want to move on, love allows people to go and pursue their happiness. So, you know, yeah. I want what you just said, Adam, my exes out there, you know, who are haters. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I just want to say, look, I got nothing but love for you, and stop hating and just move on. It's all good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, you you're, you you control your experience. Exactly. Right? You know, the world throws things at you all the time, constantly. It's gonna throw things at you, and how you take those things and how you react to those things is your life. Exactly. That is, that's your life. You and and you have a choice. You know, uh, you, you don't. You can't control what other people do to you, but you can control how you choose to react to it. So um, and that's the key. You know, you hear all the time, like you know, happiness is a choice, and you just have to make that choice to be happy. And you know, and granted, it's not an easy thing to no. accomplish once you do make that choice. It's still a lot of work, but you know, so is being miserable. Like, being miserable <laughs> is a lot of work too. And there, to me, there's no real payoff except you get to be a victim, you know, right. and you get to blame somebody else. But, you know, if you look at all the miserable people, they're so, their faces are ugly. You know, they age, you know, very badly. And it, it's like, okay, go look in the mirror and see, did that really pay off for you? Is that really, really working for you? Right, exactly. <laughs> and I guarantee you that you're not going to find many people who will tell you, yeah. Yeah, it's working for me. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I I just choose to laugh and um, not take life seriously anymore because I don't like the way it makes me look when I look in the mirror. So um, right? that's my gift to you guys out there. Look in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> look in the mirror. It, it tells a lot, right? <laughs> it doesn't lie. <laughs> okay, so. And, and that's the best part about, you know, doing this, this uh, this film and this project was, you know, just getting to see and really experience all these incredibly happy people, and for so many different reasons. You just, you know, you you said Gloria makes other people happy, and it, and the reason why is because happiness is contagious. Yes, if you're around somebody who's happy, you just can't help but. Exactly. I can't that, right? be around miserable people, Adam. I just can't. I, I choose not to do that anymore. You know, if you can't bring something into my, you know, presence that uplifts me, inspires me, or at least makes me laugh, then I really can't spend any time around you. I w- I'm going to get away from you as soon as possible. Right, now, you only got so much time to <laughs> with people that make you happy, right? And look, I've spent enough of my life with miserable people, miserable whining people, you know, who just want to make other people miserable. So, hey, you're done look, with that. I ain't mad at y'all. <laughs> okay, I'm not mad at y'all, but just stay over there, okay? Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now speaking of, in your film, I loved the Do Good Bench Bandits. Oh, my God, in Detroit. Oh, yeah. I mean, that. Oh, what a concept. Oh, yeah, they're great, right? Right. Now, we're not going to tell all of the, you know, we want people to see the film. So I'm just going to say you got to check out the, the young Do Good Bench Bandits in Detroit. And um, they will show you how little bitty things that you do can not only make you feel good about yourself, but just bring enrich so many lives. And then, I, Adam, I want to move on to uh, happiness and income because 
you know everybody thinks that if you just have enough money, you're going to be happy. And I was aware of the study, of, of course, because I've been studying happiness for, you know, some years about, right. um, you know, people thinking that, you know, money, especially people who are below um, a certain level of income, they think if they just have enough money, they're going to be happy. And I've always told my students that, that you know, once you get to a certain income level, you know, it's going to make you comfortable, but it's not going to make you happy. And the research shows that, um, that after about $75,000 a year of income, the level of happiness does not increase anymore <laughs> after that. You do yeah. need money. I'm not saying you don't right. need money, you know, right. to live a comfortable life. Dr. Johnson Brewer, mm -hmm. and he was pointing out, he said, you know, there, were, there was these people, they put them in a scanner, like a brain scanner, mm -hmm. and, and they, would, they would see what happened when people would talk about themselves. <laughs> and what the most interesting part was, is it lit up this part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> <laughs> Close uh, enough. <laughs> and what's amazing about that part of the brain is it's the same part of the brain that lights up when you do crack cocaine. How about that? Or heroin or any of those. <laughs> right. And so it's clearly the addiction center, right? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so in a way, we are addicted to ourselves. Yes. And it's yeah. so pervasive, right? You see it everywhere. It's like with all the selfies and the Facebooks and the, you know, it's like everybody is like all into themselves. And the, the, the interesting thing in the correlation that I make in the film is that that is a road to unhappiness, mm -hmm. not happiness. Yeah, because yeah. As, as we also discovered, happiness is the, the reason that why happiness exists in the first place, why we feel this emotion, is to bond us together, to yes. bring us together as... As social Maybe. animals. We're social animals. Yeah. And um, that, that brings me um, to this, this point about America being so narcissistic. I laughed, you know, with that, about that study because it's like yeah. I'm a psychologist and my, um, you know, my whole dissertation was on personality disorders and narcissism is literally worshipped in America. So, of course, right. <laughs> you know, people would rather uh, talk about themselves than make money. Uh, but but now that brings me to this other group um, in the film um, that this guy, he was uh, so, sort of a social anthropologist and he went to this tribe in South America and lived uh -huh. with them for a couple of years. And what he found was that they were the happiest people that he had ever met, you know, as a group. And it was all related to their self-sufficiency and feeling essential to a group of people and feeling that your work and your contribution to the group um, matters. And so he concluded that giving people a sense that they matter um, can make you happy. And so for me as a professor, an author, a teacher, you know, um, I, that's what I give to my students, the sense that you're unique, you, are you, you have a purpose on this planet, and you are special no matter what people have told you about yourself. And dispelling that, that whole lie, it makes them so happy and, and their lives Lives go from, you know, being suicidal to, oh my God, I, I, I want to do something and make a difference in the world. So I could really, really relate to that study. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, and that speaks right to the heart of, you know, why happiness exists in the first place. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's not, we weren't put on this earth to be great individually, you know. <laughs> We're social animals, <laughs> let's face it. Right. I mean, that's, that's how we survive. We're not big and strong like lions and tigers and mm -hmm. bears and elephants. You know, it's like we, we're not going to beat them one-on-one -on -one with our brute strength. Mm -hmm. The way we're going to beat them is in groups. Yeah. You know, if we team up, we can accomplish amazing, amazing things. And if you just look at the world, you can see that. Yeah. And there's, there's no way that anybody, even if you pick out the greats in society, you know, you want to talk Steve Jobs, you want to talk... Um, you know, Bill Gates on the, you know, on all the technology they've created in the world. You want to talk any president of any country, any, you know, Gandhi, any of these people did not work alone. Uh, my friend says uh, teamwork makes the dream work. Exactly. <laughs> Adam, I'm going to share, and then I'm going to let you close out the show with some of the secrets that I learned from your film. So, of course, you know I'm going to start with Gloria. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she says, make the most of our lives right now by how we choose to live our lives in each moment and by making a choice to be grateful 
positive and joyful. How about that? Okay, to make that happiness a priority. I mean, most of us don't even have that on the list. Um, right. To build strong communities. Um, that was another great theme in the movie. Um, and how about fixing what is broken and paying attention to the needs of others? You know, we, we tend to have this disposable mentality of throwing everything away. And Randy fixed all the broken things. And um, he paid attention to the needs of others, and he was always giving things to others, and then they were always giving things back to him. And then uh, to focus on what you have and not what has been taken away, which is what Gloria did, um, to know that fear is the true enemy of happiness and that happiness awaits when we conquer our fears and that happiness comes from appreciating what you do have. That I, I learned is that happiness is not something that you can pursue directly. You can't make this decision that I'm going to go after happiness yes. and expect to achieve it. Yes. And that's what we really set out to highlight is, is all the things that you can do and all the things. Happiness is a reward mm -hmm. for doing other things. <laughs> I think and it's so. Those, it's those other things that bring us happiness, not going after happiness directly because happiness you can't define it well what That's what was so, the definition of pursuit pursue is to follow in hostility oh my god wasn't you that know? profound <laughs> right <laughs> it's like you're, you're chasing this thing it's like the, it's like that dream you have where you're running really fast but uh -huh. you can't run at all you know and you're like sludging through the mud but you're like there's nothing holding me back why can't i go and that's and it's and happiness is always going to be out there in front of you if you try and chase it down. Yeah. So the key is this. The key is all the things that you just said. And, and I think that the true enemy of happiness is fear. Yes, of course. And when we course. live our lives in fear of whatever, mm -hmm. death, you know, loss, you know, uh, whatever you live your life in fear of. Right. If you live your life in fear, it's going to prevent you from being happy. Sure. If you can let go of that fear and you can say, you know what? Life is beautiful it right is. here, right now, no matter what I'm experiencing. It's still beautiful. It's still part of why we're here. Thank you so much, Adam Shell, for joining us on Divine Love Talk to uh, share your journey to happiness. And, Thank you so much. And, and I want to say that uh, an early definition of pursue was annoyance or persecution. <laughs> so, yeah. so we should just allow, you know, things to unfold. And, um, you, and for me, it's about freedom, you know, of expression and freedom to be and allowing others to be free to be as well. That makes me happy. So thank you all for joining me every week on Divine Love Talk and allowing me to have this forum to pursue my own form of happiness.